Hello everyone. I'm Dr. Alaa Musbah, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Faculty of Medicine, Mansoura University. The topic of my lecture today about female pony pelvis. So what we wanted to discuss today? The structure of the female pony pelvis, the function of the pony pelvis, pelvic axis and the inclination, the pelvic inlet, cavity and the outlet, and lastly, the classification of the pelvic types. Let us start our journey with the structure of the female pony pelvis. As you see in the picture, the pelvis is formed of sacrum and the coccyx, and the two hip wounds, or innominic wounds, on both sides, okay? The two hip wounds joins posteriorly through the sacrum, through the sacral iliac joint on both sides, and the anteriorly at the symphysis pubis. And the, in the other picture, you can see the acetabulum. So, the pelvic bone incorporates the acetabulum, which articulate with the femur and the hip joint. In a childhood, these three wounds, the ilium, ischium, and the pubic bone, as in the picture, is connected together by the triradiate cartilage. At the, at the puberty, these wounds fuse. Okay? So, what about the ilium? The ilium is this part, is the major portion of the pelvic bone. Two bones, one in each side, curving towards the front of the body, as you see, curving towards the front of the body. The other bone here is the ischium. The ischium considered the lower part of the pelvis form it from two fused bones as you see here the pubic bones is the third part of bones of the hip bone or a nominate bone the pubic bone on either side form the front part of the pelvis and the post pubic bone meet at the middle which is the symphysis pubis this part so I have ilium, ischium, and pubic bone. This area is called the pubic arch. What about the sacrum? As you see in the picture, the sacrum is a wedge-shaped taper at the back of the pelvis. And it consists of five fused vertebrae. And the coccyx is present at the bottom here, tail like pony projection at the bottom of the sacrum. This is the coccyx, as you see in the picture. This is the coccyx, and this is the coccyx, and this is the fused vertebra of the sacrum. This is the area of the sacrum on both sides, and this is the sacral canal, and this is the spinous tubercle. What about the joints and ligaments? I have three joints, sacroiliac joint, sacrocoxygeal joint, and symphysis pubis. Sacro-iliac joint between the ilium, as in the picture, and the sacrum. It's called sacro-iliac joint. sacro between the sacrum and the coccyx. Pubic symphysis between the two pubic bone on both sides is called pubic symphysis. Here, this area. 
What about the ligaments? There are, there are many ligaments in the pelvis, actually, like sacrospinous ligament, this one, sacrotuberous ligament, this one, sacrospinous between the sacrum and the ischial spine, sacrotuberous between the sacrum and ischial tuberosity, sacroiliac. So I have many ligaments. And these ligaments attach the lateral border of the sacrum to various bony landmarks on the bony pelvis to aid stability. Okay. What about the true and the false pelvis? What is the false pelvis and what is the true pelvis? Please look at the, the picture here. This is the pelvic frame or pelvic inlet, this area. Above the pelvic brim is called false pelvis. Below the pelvic brim is called the true pelvis, which consists of inlet, cavity, and the outlet. So this area in blue, this is the false pelvis. And this pink area is the true pelvis. Okay? Okay. What is the benefits of the false pelvis it gives support to the lower abdominal viscera and enlarging gravity uterus but has no relation to the childbirth of no clinical significance as regards the childbirth this is the false pelvis but the true pelvis is related to childbirth and the false pelvis boundaries from posterior to anterior, the lower lumbar vertebra here, laterally the, the iliac fossa on both sides, anteriorly the lower portion of the anterior abdominal wall. What about the true pelvis? True pelvis consists of pelvic inlet this area is called the pelvic inlet or the pelvic brim pelvic cavity and pelvic outlet as in the picture here this is the pelvic outlet which is losing shape pelvic inlet which is rounded or slightly oval in transverse X okay this is the inlet cavity and outlet what is the function of the female pony pelvis many functions related to pelvic wound it protect the abdominal pelvic and pelvic viscera also provides attachments for number of muscles and ligaments used in locomotion also transfer weight from the upper axial skeleton to the lower components of the skeleton which is the lower limbs in obstetrics adaptation for childbirth as the changes which happen during pregnancy in ligaments and relaxation under the effect of progesterone hormone and the relaxine hormone this effect make of this effect of hormones on ligaments make the pelvis more capacious also the characters of the gynecoid pelvis itself is helpful for the passage of the baby through the outlet cavity and the outlet so it is very helpful for childbirth and the female pelvis, of course, differ than the male pelvis. What is about the pelvic axis? We have anatomical axis and the obstetric axis. The anatomical axis, about, look to this picture. If we have a center point in the pelvic prime inlet and cavity and the outlet, it will take the shape of letter C, okay? But this anatomical axis of no obstetric importance. Because what is important for us really 
is the obstetric axis as in this picture lower down here. This is the G-shaped obstetric axis. It is an imaginary line represents the way passed by the head during labor. When the head, as you see in the picture, the head moves downward and backward. Then, at the level of the scale of spine, it changes its direction to be downward and forward. So, it looks like G shape. What about the pelvic inclination? The pelvic inlet makes an angle about 55 with the horizon or range between 50 to 60. As you see in the picture, this is the plane of pelvic inlet and this is the horizontal line. This angle is 55 degree. Okay, this is called pelvic inclination. If the angle is greater than 55, this makes the descent of the vital head in the pelvis difficult. Okay. In general, the general inclination of the pelvis is maintained by balance tension between different muscular and fascial anatomical components like abdominal wall muscle, like psoas muscle, and so on. Okay. Okay. Another angle here you can see in the picture is 15 degree. It is between the plane of pelvic outlet and the horizon. It is 15 degree. So the plane between the pelvic inlet and the horizon is 55 degree and this is called pelvic inclination. Let us start with the pelvic inlet and we will start the boundaries from posterior to anterior. From posterior to anterior, as in the picture here, starting from the sacral proboundary, ala of the sacrum, sacroiliac joint, iliobectineal line, iliobectineal eminence, upper border of the superior pubic rami, Pubic tubercle, pubic crest, this area is called pubic crest, and upper border of the symphysis pubis. What about the diameters of the pelvic end? Anatomical anteroposterior diameter, about 11 cm, start from the tip of the sacral promontory to the upper border of the symphysis pubis. Obstetric conjugate, 10.5 cm, from the tip of the sacral promontory to the most bulging point on the back of the symphysis pubis. You can see it here. This orange one is the obstetric conjugate, 10.5 cm. And the black one, from sacral promontory to the upper border of the symphysis pubis, this is called the true conjugate or anatomical anteroposterior diameter, it is 11 cm. Next is the diagonal, sorry, next is the diagonal conjugate. What is the diagonal conjugate? From the sacral promontory to the lower border of the symphysis pubis from the sacral promontory to the lower border of the symphysis pubis. It is 12.5 cm. This diagonal conjugate is the diameter of the inlet which can be tested clinically. During BV examination, I can insert my two finger inside the pelvis trying to reach the promontory. If I reach it, the promontory, be sure that there is contracted inlet, decreased anteroposterior diameter. Why? Because the two finger mostly is less than 12.5 centimeter. So if you are trying to measure the diagonal conjugate during BV and you reach it, the sacral promontory, this means it is contracted. 
annulet or decreased anteroposterior diameter. Okay, why? Because we we expect the two finger to be in length less than twelve point five centimeter. Okay, okay. What is next? The external conjugate twenty centimeter from the depression below the last lumbar spine to the upper anterior margin of the symphysis pubis. This one, in the picture. This is the external conjugate. It is twenty centimeter. It is measured by using pulvimeter. What is next? The transverse diameter of the pelvic inlet. We have anatomical one and the obstetric one, and the anatomical one is bigger. The anatomical one is thirteen centimeter, while the obstetrical one is thirty is twelve centimeter. So anatomical is thirteen, obstetric transverse diameter is twelve centimeter. The anatomical one, the red one here, between the farthest two points on the iliobectonial line. This is the iliobectonial line, and this is the farthest point here and here. So this line is thirteen centimeter. While the it lies anterior to the sacral promontory by four centimeter, and somebody call this the posterior sagittal, and seven centimeter behind the symphysis. Okay, if we said this is the true conjugate, the anteroposterior diameter, and this is the transverse diameter, this area is four centimeter, and this area is seven centimeter, so. We know that the true conjugate is 11 centimeters, so 4 centimeter posterior and 7 centimeter anterior. Okay? Okay. And the transverse diameter, the anatomical one between the farthest points on the iliobectinial line here, is 13 centimeters. What about the obstetric one? The obstetric one is less than the anatomical one it is 12 centimeter it is 12 centimeter it bisects the true conjugate and is slightly shorter than the anatomical transverse diameter okay so where it is this one this is the obstetric transverse diameter okay it bisects the true conjugate as you see here and it is 12 centimeter we have also oblique diameters right oblique left oblique and sacrocotyledon diameter right oblique look to this picture please starting from right sacroiliac joint here we, we said before we will start from posterior to anterior all the time we started from the sacro right sacroiliac joint here to the left iliobectineal eminence okay and the left one start from left sacroiliac joint here to the right iliobectineal eminence both of them, each one right and the left oblique diameter is 12 centimeter. What about the sacrocotyloid diameter, which is 9.5 centimeter? Starting from the circular promontory to the right and the left iliobectineal eminence, as you see in the picture here, the blue one, this is the sacrocotyloid diameter, starting from the sacral promontory to the right iliobectineal eminence okay and from the other side the same from sacral promontory to the left iliobectineal eminence okay okay i wanted to say something about the right oblique and left oblique 
The left oblique is occupied by the sigmoid, as we know. So, the right oblique looks longer and more favorable for the head because it, it, it is longer because the left one is occupied by the sigmoid cool. So, remember this difference, little difference between right oblique and the left oblique. What is the pelvic index? The pelvic index, you can calculate it by dividing the anteroposterior diameter on the transverse diameter of the L, and then multiply by 100. Normally, range between 85 to 90% in European population. What about the pelvic cavity? Please look to this picture. This is the plane of pelvic inlet. This is the plane of pelvic cavity. This is the plane of pelvic outlet. Okay? Okay. The pelvic cavity boundaries posteriorly by the longer sacrum. This one. Anteriorly by the shorter symphysis pubis. The sacrum, by the way, is 10 centimeter while the symphysis pubis is 5 centimeter. The roof is the plane of pelvic brim. The roof of this pelvic cavity is the plane of pelvic brim. The floor is the plane of least pelvic dimension at the outlet. So, pelvic cavity between the pelvic brim and plane of least pelvic dimension. Okay? What about the plane of greatest pelvic dimension? Please look to this picture. This is the plane of greatest pelvic dimension. And this is the plane of least pelvic dimension. And this is the plane of the inlet. Okay? The plane of greatest pelvic dimension is rounded with all diameter equal to 12.5 centimeters. It is bounded posteriorly by the junction of the second and third sacral vertebra. Laterally, bust to the center of the acetabulum and the upper part of the greater sciatic notch. Anteriorly, by the middle of the posterior surface of the pubis, symphysis pubis. What is the importance of the plane of greatest pelvic dimension? Internal rotation occurs when the vibrator diameter of the head occupies this wide plane of the pelvis. At the same moment, the oxwood impinges on the pelvic floor. And so, the oxwood during internal rotation lies at the level of the plane of least pelvic dimension. How wide? The vibrator diameter occupying the plane of greatest pelvic dimension, allowing internal rotation. What about the pelvic outlet? The boundaries start from the tip of the sacrum posterior, laterally the ischial spine, Anteriorly, lower border of the symphysis pubis. This is a view of the out. It is the plane of least pelvic dimension, or you can, can consider it the roof of the outlet is the plane of least pelvic dimension, and the floor is the anatomical outlet, as you see here. This is the plane of least pelvic dimension, and this is the anatomical outlet, as you see. Okay? So, this is the outlet. What is the importance of the plane of the obstetric outlet? 
it is a plane of least pelvic dimension. The head is considered engaged if the vault reaches it. And it is a plane of pelvic floor. This is this is the plane where the pelvic axis turn forward. If you remember the G-shaped obstetric axis, we said at the plane of the ischial spine or plane of least pelvic dimension, the, the head turns downward and forward. What is the diameter of the pelvic outlet? We'll start with the anatomical one anteroposterior diameter the anatomical anteroposterior diameter from the tap of the coccyx as you see in the picture to the lower border of the symphysis pubis and this is the anatomical one is 11 centimeter while the obstetric anteroposterior diameter is 13 centimeter why because it is started from the tip of the sacrum, not the coccyx. Because the coccyx is pushed backward during labor, so the obstetric anteroposterior diameter starts from the tip of the sacrum, not the coccyx. To the lower border of the symphysis pubis, that's why it is longer than the anatomical one. So obstetric anteroposterior diameter is 13 centimeter while the anatomical anteroposterior diameter is 11 centimeter what is the transverse diameter bituberous diameter and bispinous diameter which is larger one the bituberous diameter between two ischial tuberosities as you see in the picture and it is 11 centimeter a while the Bispinous diameter is 10.5 cm between the two ischial spine. And you can see in this figure down here, if we apply the closed fist between two ischial tuberosities, so this means the bifuberous diameter is adequate or enough for delivery, so or equal 11 cm or more. So this test can be done clinically to apply the closed fist between the two ischial tuberosity as you see here this is the ischial tuberosity and this is a closed fist between if it can pass between this diameter so actually this diameter is good what about the anatomical outlet the anatomical outlet is losing shape as you see here is losing shape its boundaries start from the tip of the coccyx sacrotuberous and the sacrospinous ligaments this is the sacrotuberous on both sides and sacrospinous ligaments ischial tuberosity this is the ischial tuberosity pubic arch this is the pubic arch this area the lower border of the symphysis pubis. And this anatomical outlet can be divided into two triangular planes at different levels. Anterior and posterior sagittal planes. This triangle in green in color is the anterior sagittal. This in red is the posterior sagittal. Both of them has a common base, which is the bituberous diameter between the two ischial tuberosities. So the base is common for both, is the bituberous diameter here, and the apex is different. The apex in anterior sagittal is the lower border of the symphysis pubis, while the apex in posterior sagittal is the tip of the sacrum okay during labor because the coccyx is pushed downward backward okay so when the coccyx pushed backward so the tip 
of the sacrum will be the apex for the posterior surgery. What is the anterior sagittal diameter and the posterior sagittal diameter? The anterior sagittal diameter starts from the lower border of the symphysis pubis to the center of bitubular diameter, this area. It equals 7 cm. While the posterior sagittal starts from the center of the bitubular diameter, to the tip of the sacrum. Okay, it equals 7.5 to 10 centimeter, while the anterior sagittal is 6 to 7 centimeter. And Tom's dictum means if the sum of bituberous and posterior sagittal diameter exceed 15 centimeter at and the, the, at the same time, bituberous diameter is more than 8 cm, so vaginal delivery is allowed with episiotomy and maybe low force. But if the thumb's tectum is less than 15 cm, I mean, if we add the posterior sagittal plus the bituberous diameter and the result is less than 15 cm, or the bituberous diameter is less than 8 cm, cesarean section is performed because I have contracted out. So, what is the waste space of Morris? Waste space of Morris. Look to this picture, please. Imagine this is the head, this is the pubic arch. This is the waste space of Morris, which is equal to one centimeter. This area, okay? Imagine this is the head, so it is 9.4 or 9.5 centimeter in well-flexed head. It passes through the pubic arch at a distance of one centimeter from midpoint of the inferior border of the symphysis pubis. Okay? okay? So, if this pubic arch is narrow, the waste space of Morris will be more than one centimeter. If this is wide, the pubic arch is wide, as in gynecoid pubis, the width space will be one centimeter or less, okay? So, the greater the waste space, the more the narrow the pubic arch, the more difficulty is the delivery, okay? And what is the effect? In case of an adequate pelvis with narrow pubic arch, the fetal head will be pushed backward and the waste space of mortis would increase. When the head pushed backward, it will take the smaller diameters which is available right now, the smaller anteroposterior diameter, okay? And this is likely to do injury to the perineum or sometimes cause the arrest of the fetal head, okay? So, what is the importance of the level of the ischial spine, which is a plane of least pelvic dimension? It is considered the plane of least pelvic dimension, as you see here. This is the ischial spine, the picture. It's considered the plane of least pelvic dimension. And also, it is the point where the, the head changes its direction in obstetric axis from downward and backward to downward and forward as we said before it is g-shaped also levator in eye muscle situated at the level of the ischial spine 
and also ischiococcygeous part of the levator is attached to the ischial spine. As in this picture, also the level of ischial spine helped me in diagnosis engagement because when he had reached the level of the ischial spine, which is a station zero in delay, missile, the head is considered engaged. If it is lower down, plus one, plus two, plus three, it is more engaged, okay? Also, the head will rotate, internal rotation, when the occiput is at this level. Also, the importance of level of SKL spine, including that if you apply forceps to the head below the ischial spine, is outlet forceps. If you apply it at the level of the ischial spine, it is mid forceps. Above the ischial spine, it is high forceps. Of course, in modern obstetrics, we are not using either mid forceps or high forceps. Only forceps can be applied to the outlet if the head is below the ischial spine. Also, SKL spine helped me to identify the area where I inject the local anesthesia in case of pudendal nerve block, as in this picture. Also, you can consider the SKL spine as a landmark where the external os at the same level and also vaginal fornices beside it. So external loss at the same level of the ischial spine. So when there is prolapse, the center of the cervix or you try and descend will descend below the level of the ischial spine. During the ap application of or applying ring pissary in cases of prolapse, you should apply the pissary above the level of the ischial spine to be inserted properly. So this is how important is the level of the ischial spine. In 1933, Caldwell and the Molloy classification of the pelvic types still present in textbook till recent years. They divided the pelvis into four types, gynecoid pelvis constitute 50%, android pelvis 20%, anthropoid pelvis 25%, flat pelvis pelvis or flat or rachitic pelvis 5%. What is the difference between them? There is difference between them in inlet, in cavity and in outlet. As regards the inlet, you will see the gynecoid pelvis as a rounded or slightly oval in transverse axis diameter. And this is the normal female type. Android pelvis it is heart shaped with anterior narrow apex and it is a male type. Anthropoid pelvis it is oval in anthroposterior axis, it is ape like type. That's why it is oval in anthroposterior axis. That's why the diameters belong to anthroposterior diameters is larger, while the transverse diameter is lower in this pelvis. The reverse in platypeloid pelvis, which is oval in transverse axis. So the transverse diameter will be increased, while the anthroposterior diameter is decreased. What about the cavity? In gynecoid, it is shallow. In android pelvis, it is funnel shaped and deep. And this is constitute a problem during delivery. Anthropoid pelvis, it is deep. Platypeloid pelvis, it is shallow. What about the sacrum? It is in gynecoid pelvis, it is broad and well curved. A while it is narrow and flat and less curved in android pelvis or it is narrow and long and slightly curved in anthropoid pelvis and in platypeloid pelvis it is broad and slightly curved 
What about the side wall? It is straight in gynecoid pelvis, while it is convergent in android pelvis, decreasing the diameters because it is convergent. While in anthropoid, it is divergent, and in platyloid, it is divergent. What about the sacrocytic notch? It is wide in gynecoid pelvis, narrow in android pelvis, wide in anthropoid, and slightly narrow in platyloid. What about the ischial spine? It is blunt in all pelvis, except android, it is projecting. You can see the ischial spine projecting on either side. What about the outlet, the subpubic angle? The pubic arch, the angle in gynecoid pelvis is optimal, wide, between 90 to 100 degrees, a while in android pelvis, narrow angle, less than 90, in anthropoid, also narrow, less than 90, a while in flat, flat pelvis pelvis is wide, is more than 100. So, what about the head engagement? In which diameter? In gynecoid pelvis, it occurs in oblique diameter, while in android pelvis, in transverse diameter, while in anthropoid pelvis, in anthroposterior diameter, while in flat, flat pelvis, pelvis, in transverse diameter. Why? Because the head chooses the widest diameter, the largest diameter. What is the clinical significance of each pelvic type? We can say that the gynecoid pelvis is the normal pelvic reserve capacity. Has the normal pelvic reserve capacity. And the occipital anterior is common in gynecoid pelvis. While in android pelvis, occipital posterior is common and deep transverse arrest also is commonly happen. In anthropoid pelvis, occipital posterior is common and the face to pubis commonly occurs. So when the head rotates its circle posteriorly in occipital posterior becomes a face to pubis. And in flat or bilateraloid pelvis, deep transverse arrest commonly occur. And this picture show you the gynecoid, the android, the anthropoid and the platyloid pelvis. And you can see also here the different types of pelvis as regard the shape, the inlet, the mid pelvis, and the outlet. You can see the inlet of the gynecoid round or slightly oval in transverse axis. While the android is heart shaped with narrow apex, while the anthropoid is oval in longitudinal diameter, while the platyloid is oval in transverse axis. Also, you can see the converging, the conversion of the cavity in android pelvis while it is straight in gynecoid pelvis and divergent in anthropoid and the platyloid pelvis. You can see the wide pubic arch in the outlet of the gynecoid pelvis. While it is narrow in android and anthropoid pelvis and very wide in more than 100 degree in flat platyloid pelvis. Of course, this is the main difference between the four types of pelvis. But you should know that the gynecoid pelvis is the classical female pelvic type. But many female pelvises are a mixture of pelvic types. And in this picture, you can see the gynecoid pelvis, how it looks, and the android pelvis, how it looks. And you can see the jutting the ischial tuberosity prominent here. 
you can see it and you can see the narrow subcubic arch the narrow angle less than 90 Hawaii and gynecoid pelvis is 90 or more than 9 the subcubic arch and in the other picture here this picture of android pelvis this picture of gynecoid pelvis this picture of latibelloid pelvis this picture of anthropoid pelvis We can say that the female pelvis is different than male pelvis, of course. It is wider, shorter, and shallower for accommodation of the fetal head and parturition, transverse diameter of the inlet, oblique diameter of the cavity, and the anteroposterior diameter of the outlet are maximum. This is the end of lecture. Thank you. I'm Dr. Alam Musbah, Professor of Obstetrics in the Gynecology Faculty of Medicine, Mansoura University.